Well, man, I'm so glad that you're here. And we're kicking off a brand new series today called Stuck Together. And that kind of describes where a lot of us have been, right? <laughs> the last few months we've been stuck together. And, uh, and I've kind of heard two different extremes on this. Um, I've heard some people say that it's been wonderful and, uh, and awesome, right? Thank you, Eric, I'm good. That it's been awesome. I've heard two extremes. It's been like, we've been together and, and we've played games as a family and, and we've hung out as friends and it's been awesome and wonderful. Or the other extreme has been, I wanna kill them and um, this has been more frustrated than ever and I'm fighting more than ever. And, and uh, not to joke around, but I've heard some reports of people having really serious challenges, right? There hasn't been really any in between. It hasn't really been like, ah, that's okay. It's been one extreme or the other because we've been stuck together. And here's what I also hear this is what is in the tagline of this. The, the tagline of this series is when love is not the problem. Because I'll hear people say things like this. I love them, but their family, but are y'all with me? And so often it, it isn't that we don't necessarily feel like we love someone, it's that there are other challenges in the relationship that we're not really sure how to deal with. And I just wanna to say to you that God has some answers for this, that the word of God has some, some ways for us to go about relationships that, that I would propose that God wants our relationships healthy and thriving and God wants our relationships to move forward and, and he wants them full of joy and he wants them life-giving and he wants them hope-filled and, and he wants them supportive. And, and how many of you know that relationships can be some of the most powerful things in our life? Like the right relationship can, can catapult you to a level in your life that maybe you've never been before. I know for me that right relationships have opened doors for me that I never could have opened myself, that I'm here today because I had some right relationships along the way. I had some relationships that spoke life into me, that encouraged me, that challenged me. I, I had some relationships that were corrective in my life. Hello, my professor, sophomore year, when he took me to lunch and said, you're arrogant. <laughs> you're super talented, but you're super arrogant, and your arrogance is going to kill your talent. I wouldn't have been here if that professor hadn't done that for me. I had some relationships that have got me to where I am today, and the same is true for you. And I've had some other relationships that have taken me down some roads that aren't so great. Hey man, try this. <laughs> Anybody been there? <laughs> that guy, that girl, that friend, you know, and I've tried some things that I probably shouldn't have tried because I had some relationships. Are, are y'all with me? There's some relationships that are so life-giving that when you see their number, you're like, I want to answer that. I want to talk to them. I want to go to coffee with them. I want to hang out with them six feet away from them. I want to be around them. COVID-friendly messages. Uh, you know, because they breathe such life into you. And then there's some other ones that you're like, they are vampires and they will suck all the life out. Some of you are like, they're with me. I can't say amen. <laughs> I really want to say amen right now, but they're, they're in the chat right now and I can't. And they're right here in the... And there's some that are good, some that are bad, some that fill you, some that drain you. And they're challenging to navigate, and I just want to say in this series, though, I believe God has some, some principles for us, and that some things that if we'll actually apply to our life, that not just to be a hearer of the word, but actually be a doer of the word, then it can transform us from the inside out. I want to work from this verse today found in Colossians. It says this, so then, just as you receive Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in him rooted and built up in him. Somebody shout rooted. rooted. Rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught and overflowing with thankfulness. I want you to receive Christ, Paul writes, continue to live your lives in him, rooted and built up in him. Rooted and built up in him. If you're not rooted, you cannot be built up. If you don't have a foundation, you can't go up high. If you don't go down deep first, you can't go up high later. You don't build a skyscraper on one inch thick footers. You go deep. You get rooted. Are you following me? It reminds me of the verse in the scripture that says this, that we're to be like trees planted by the water and we will bear fruit 
in due season, that, that we're to be rooted. Why is Paul talking about being rooted and built up here? The reason he is is because he understands this, that your fruit is a result of your root. If you're not a note taker, write that one down. <laughs> that your root fruit is a result of your root. And here's my concern in relationships and challenges that we all face in any area, whether it's a working relationship, a friendship, a dating, marriage, whatever it may be, is that we are trying to make the fruit look good when the root is the issue. That, that we, are, we, are, we are trying to hit it at fruit issues. And, and we even try to make the fruit look, well, if I could just paint the fruit. So, so we want to paint the fruit and make it look good. And we want to tape the fruit and make it look good. And we do all kinds of things that if I, just, if I did this or if I bought them that or if I could just date this person or if I could get that job, if I could get into this peer group, if I could get into that. And we're trying to paint the fruit thinking that if we could make the fruit right, then life would be right. But I want to propose to you today that if you'll get the root right, the fruit will take care of itself. That was a good preacher. And so in this series, I don't want to just deal with fruit things. I don't want to just tell you how six steps to a better date night and, and five keys to better. I want to get down into the root issue and dig a little deeper into our life and go, maybe if I would deal with the root and I had healthy roots and I had established roots and they were being fed by the right nutrients, then maybe I'd get the fruit that I want in my life. Some of us have got religion and religion says, make the fruit pretty. Jesus says, make the root right. If you'll get the root right, the fruit will be right. It's like, I don't, I don't, if, if I want to be, if I want to have the fruit of the spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control. If I want to have those, I don't get up in the morning and go be more self-controlling. No, I get more of the Holy Spirit in me because it is the fruit of the Spirit. If I get the root right, if I get the Spirit of God working on the inside of me, adjusting things, confronting things, correcting things, then I will get the fruit that I want. Are you following me? Religion says create behaviors that are better. Jesus says, let me transform you from the root. And so if we're going to have the kind of relationships that we want, we got to get to the root. We got to be rooted and built up, rooted and built up. Because if I get the root right, I'll get the fruit right. And so today I wanna start talking with, with getting our roots right and getting our roots healthy. I think sometimes when we think about relationships, we're like, oh, I hope they're listening. I hope he's getting this. I'm gonna bring him every week, preacher, tell him. And my, my proposal was this, is that maybe if you would get you, maybe, maybe the person to deal with is the one you look at in the mirror at every morning, right? I can't, I can't always control everybody around me. I can't control everybody around me. And I'm not saying that, that you getting you right is going to completely solve all your issues, but it'll fix 50% of them because you half of the problem. Are y'all with me? And so I want to deal with the root of those things because I feel like in this season that we've been stuck together and it's created tensions and, and we've had uh, racial unrest and somebody posted this and somebody said that and it's created tensions and it's created division and it's created issues and we're like, well, if they would change that or if they would fix that or if he would do that or she would stop that or my boss would stop that or they wouldn't post that or they wouldn't say that, then it would all be fine. And I'm just trying to tell you today that it wouldn't all be fine until you deal with your roots. You can't control everybody else, but guess who you can control? You can control you. You can't fix everybody else, but guess who you can fix? With the help of the Holy Spirit. You. And so I want to talk about that today, and I want to bring you a message entitled this, The Cycle of Deception. The Cycle of Deception. I just believe if we would expose, and we're going to do that today, expose the ways that we're deceived in relationships, it would go away, a long way toward having healthy roots that would bear good fruit in our relationship. If you're with me, say amen. I want to go to the very first account in the Bible where deception enters the scene of human history. 
And it's found in Genesis chapter three. And I'll start reading in verse one and read through verse seven. It says this, now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat from fruit, eat fruit from the trees in the garden. Let me back up and rewind real quick. What's happening here is that if you remember or you're unfamiliar with the account, God created Adam and Eve in the garden and everything in it. He put them in it and he said, have dominion and rule over it. So them as a couple, husband and wife were to have dominion over the earth and rule. And so he says that to them. Then he says, you can eat from anything in the garden except the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That's the one that you can't eat from. Um, and because in the day that you do it, you'll surely die. So then the enemy comes in and he goes, did God really say? And she said, no, God said we can eat from all the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat from the tree that is in the middle of the garden and you must not touch it. Don't eat it or touch it or you will die. You will surely, you will not surely die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. And then the eyes of both of them were open and they realized that they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. I want to give you a little preview of near the end of the message. Anytime you don't do it God's way, the enemy will help shame on you and will want to make you hide. That's what they did. You should eat it, entice, 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 entice. You did it, you're a horrible person. And shame will want to make you hide. It'll make you want to hide from God. So I want to, I want to show you five things today. If you're a note taker, you should write these down. If you're not, you should write it down. Five things that are, that, that, that are a cycle of deception, and the enemy has not changed his way or of operation since the very beginning of human history. He is still operating this way today, and if he can get us deceived in the ways that we deal in relationships, then he can destroy relationships. And I would just propose that God is a relational God, and God wants you to have good, life-giving, healthy relationships. God designed them, created them. He is relational. Even in the, the beginning of the scriptures, we see that he is a triune God. He is in relationships, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, in relationship. We see that he created that Adam and Eve. He wanted relationship with them. We see that sin broke that relationship. So what did he do? He sent Jesus to restore the relationship. Are y'all with me? Have I built my case yet? That God is a relational God, and that he wants us to have relationship with him, and then he wants us to have relationship with others. And from the garden, the enemy has been about destroying those two things, our relationship with God and our relationship with others. If he can get us disconnected from God and he can get us disconnected from one another, then he will have a heyday with your life. But if you can stay connected with God and you can stay connected with community, then you have a really good chance of thriving in this life. Number one is this that we see in this story. I'm just going to walk through those seven verses and show you five things that, that are a cycle of deception. Number one is this. The enemy started with questioning God's word. The first step in the cycle is to get you to question God's word. The servant came to Eve, and what did he say to her? Did God really say? Did God really say? Is that really what God said? And this is where the enemy will start with you. Did God really say? Is that really how I have to act? Is that really how, really, I really have to love those who have treated me wrong? Did God really say that? I really have to forgive those who have offended me? Did God really say that? Do I really, I really have to actually do that? And he'll begin to get you. It's, it's not, it's just a questioning, just a, just a little just a little, just a little, just a little poke. The enemy doesn't destroy relationships. Friends don't stop talking to each other. People don't stop showing up at Thanksgiving and never speaking to their family again. Divorce doesn't happen in a moment. It didn't happen like that. You didn't show up one day and go, done with you. It started just with a little, just a little thing. 
Did God, does, God re, does God's word really instruct me that, that I shouldn't have emotional relationships outside of my marriage? It's not that bad, really. It's a little question. Did God really say that I should save sex for marriage? Culture says this, everybody else tell me, I'm getting pulled in so many, did God really say that? And the enemy just starts with a little thing, just a little, just a little poke, just a little poke, just a little one, little one, little one, because he plays the long game. Oh, he's patient. He's patient. He'll get just a little question in you and leave you alone for a while. Come back, a little question, leave you alone for a while. Just a little bit, then leave you alone. Just a little bit, then leave you alone for a while. Wow, he's willing to play the long game. He's willing to wait decades to destroy you. And he starts out with this, did God really? He looked at Eve and goes, did God really say that? She knew exactly what God had said. He said, we can eat of any tree, but we can't eat of this one. Really? Well, maybe, maybe, maybe. Maybe you didn't. Maybe it's okay. And some, some of us think that, that, that God's word is like, like this uh, killjoy that is confining us and keeping us from joy and happiness and, and life. And I would just propose to you that the boundaries of God's word are not there to prohibit you. They are there to protect you. That the designer and the creator of the world and the creator of you knows you best and knows what is best for you and knows what will lead to destruction, knows what will lead to joy, knows what will lead to pain, knows what will lead to sorrow, knows what will lead to life. He knows you best and he says, I'm putting these parameters in here not to prohibit you from a life that is so full of amazingness, but to protect you and if you'll work it, it will work. But here's what a lot of us want to do, and this is what culture wants us to do is this, is culture wants us to um, adjust God's word to our life. Is this too much? Y'all with me? Culture wants us to adjust God's word to my life. Well, I want to hold an offense, so I'm going to adjust God's word and try to justify that me holding offense towards you because of something you did, didn't do, didn't say, should have said, I'm going to, and so I don't have to forgive you. That's you adjusting God's word. Well, how, how, how in the world can I marry someone if I haven't test drive the goods before? I figure some parents would back me up on that one. And if you don't know what I'm saying, I'm saying, how could I marry you if I haven't had sex with you beforehand? This me, that's adjusting God's word to fit my life. But God is saying, no, 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 no. You adjust your life to fit my word. Are y'all with me? Well, it, it confronts me. I, I, don't, I don't like some of the things in here. I don't like some of the things in here. Are you kidding me? I know the benefit of some of the things in here. But I, I, I mean, sometimes I read through it and go... Yeah, new chapter. Let's... I, didn't, I didn't like that verse. It confronted my greed. I didn't, I don't, read again. Oh, I didn't like that verse. It confronted that, that bitterness that I'm holding towards that person that said that thing about me. Can I, can I be real with y'all? Oh, I didn't like that verse. It said that, it said that I, should, I should love that person that has bashed me and my church and the people that attend. Can I, can I get that real with y'all? Are y'all with me? But this word, it confronts me. You shouldn't like everything in it. Here's what the Bible says. It says, we also thank God continually because you received the word which you heard from us. You accepted it, not as the word of men, but actually as it is, the word of God. And listen to this, which is at work in you who believe. So if you've ever thought, I just, I don't, I just don't believe it because it doesn't work for me. Exactly. <laughs> it's at work in the ones who believe it. So if you don't believe it, it doesn't work. Let me say it this way. The word works if you'll work the word. The word works if you'll work the word. 
But the enemy wants to get in there and go, no, 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 you don't really have to do all that. You don't have to believe that way. You really have to, did God really say, you really, you're really gonna, it's a little radical, isn't it? It's a little crazy, right? You really need to, no, the word should confront you. It should correct me. If, let me say, I love this quote by Tim Keller. He's a pastor in New York City. He said this, if your God never disagrees with you, you might just be worshiping an idealized version of yourself. If your God never disagrees with you, when you open that word, it should disagree with you at times. There should be times where you open it and you go, oh man, I needed that. There should be times where you open it and go, whoa, we'll read the maps today. <laughs> Look at the map section. Look, there's the Mediterranean Sea. The cycle of deception, though, starts with questioning God's word. Do I really have to treat people that way? Did God really say I should love that? Did God really say that I should repair that relationship? Did God really say I should forgive that person? Did God, you don't really have to do that. You can carry that bitterness. You can carry that unforgiveness. Cycle of deception, number two is the enemy will want to downplay the consequences. He said to Eve, did God really say? And then he said, he said, you won't surely die. You're not really gonna die, are you, Eve? You're not really gonna die. He's downplaying the consequence. That's what the enemy will do with us. Carrying that, carrying that bitterness towards that person, that, Really, that's not really going to affect you. It's not going to really spread like cancer through your body and affect all your other relationships, right? Not really. You won't really die. Cutting family out of your life, it's not really going to affect you. It's not, it's not, the kids are resilient, won't hurt them. It's not really going to affect Downplay the consequence. Downplay. You know what happens when you downplay the consequence? You can justify just about anything. We're great at justifying things, aren't we? I mean, we've all done it, right? I mean, how many donuts have you justified on the diet? Come on, somebody. You justify it. Well, I walked up and down the steps a lot. Right? I went, I went to the end of the drive, we got the mail and came back. I burned at least a thousand calories. You probably burned five to be real. And the donut was 500. The Bible says this, there's a way that appears to be right, but in the end it leads to death. There's a way that you can, you can justify. It's okay. It's what the enemy wants you to do. Downplay the constant. Did God really say downplay the constant? Not a big deal. Consequences aren't bad. It's not big. It, we can justify anything, but in the end, it leads to death. Step number three is this. He began to attack God's intentions. Did God really say, you won't really die? Then what do you say next? The moment you eat it, you'll be like God, and God knows that, and he doesn't want you to have that. Begin to attack God's intentions for you. No, God, God, doesn't, God doesn't really have good things for me. That God, God's... God's intentions towards me aren't good. In the, in the moment that you eat it, God knows that God wants to rain on my relational parade. God just wants me to suffer. He doesn't really want good for me. And so if I'll just do it my way, then it'll all turn out a whole lot better because I want what's best for me and God doesn't really want what's best for me. That's what the enemy began to sell you. And I don't know what kind of church background, maybe you grew up in an environment where God was just like a killjoy that was waiting to get you and, and beat you up and tell you all the things that you couldn't do. Don't, don't drink, smoke, chew, don't go out with girls that do. I grew up in Tennessee, so you had to <laughs> add that in. Don't have sex. It's bad. It's horrible. Save it for the person you want to marry. That seems like 
Sex is horrible, it's bad, so save it for your wife. <laughs> okay. That's an interesting approach. <laughs> save it for the one you love. <laughs> and so we begin to downplay the consequences, but it's not what, what God's word teaches us. It says, you will show me the path of life. In other words, God, when I do it your way, in your presence, there's fullness of joy. But they did that. Uh, can't control them. I'm talking about your roots. It's fullness of joy. At your right hand, there's pleasures forevermore. This is the God that we serve. This is the God that we serve. This is the intentions of the God that we serve. Number four. We begin to exalt self. It's the cycle of deception. The enemy wants you to, to question God, to downplay the consequences. I want you to think it's God doesn't want anything good for you. Number four, he wants you to exalt self. He knows in the moment that you eat that you'll be like God. Come on, Eve. Think about yourself. Think about yourself. Be much better if I was in charge of this thing. Be much better if I wasn't submitted to God, that I was in charge, I was calling the shots, right? I just, I wanted, how about this one? I just got to do what makes me feel good. Man, that's dangerous. That is dangerous. That's a dangerous philosophy to live by. The dangerous one. I could be in jail if I did what I just felt sometimes. Come on, somebody. Y'all acting all holy today. <clears throat> Been to begin to exalt self, but it's not about self. What does the Bible say? It says, don't you know that your bodies are the temples of the Holy Spirit? Look at this. He says, you are not your own. If you surrendered to Christ, you're not your own. You were bought at a price called the cross. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. I'm not saying that I do it every single day of my life, but most days of my life, at some point in the morning, I go, God, I just want to say to you that I'm surrendered and submitted to you today, that my life's not mine. I don't say it because God needs to hear it. I say it because Daniel needs to hear it. I just need to remind myself again, God, I'm submitted and surrendered to you. My life isn't my own. I'm not calling the shots. You purchase me with your blood, Jesus. I'm, it's not about me. But the cycle of deception, the enemy wants you to go, it's all about me. I'd, I'd be much better off if it was just my way, what I feel, what I want, what I think. Instead of what God wants to no, know, it's not better off because this is what he does with it is finally he used the shame to trap you. So Eve, did God really say, get her to question it, what she know God told him? Did God really say, God doesn't want you to be happy. The moment you eat it, you'll be like God. And then she actually does it. The eyes are open. What were her eyes open to? Open to evil. Before their eyes were not open to that. All they saw was good. Now their eyes are open to evil. And was the first thing they do, the Bible says they realized they were naked. Before that, the Bible says they were naked and they felt no shame. Shame was not in the world. In that moment, shame entered their heart, and what's the first thing they did? I need to cover up. I need to hide. And this is what the enemy will do in your life. He will trick you, tease you, draw you along, make you think, puff you up. It's about you. God doesn't have good intentions for you. The consequences aren't that bad. You, are you really going to follow what God says? That's so old school. That's so ancient. Nobody's thinking about that anymore. Dude, and then the moment you do it, you're an idiot. Can you believe you did that? What a horrible person you are. God could never use you. God could never love you. God, and what now you're trapped into shame. What do you do? You hide. And what do you do? Condemnation causes you to run from God. And the one person you need to run to, you run away from. That's what they did, right? They hid and God came. The Bible goes on to tell us that in the cool of the day, he came walking and said, Adam and Eve, where are you? And they said, we're naked. And we, so we hid. We were ashamed. And this is what the enemy does to you. He'll do it in your relationships, and he'll do it in so many other areas of your life where he begins to get you to question one little area, and then you follow through on it because you think it's all about you and downplay the consequences, and now you're trapped in shame. And so what happens? 
So then you end up back in the cycle again. And you end up back in the cycle again. And you end up back in the cycle again. And you question. And now you slept with them. And you got up the next morning. And now you're feeling so ridden by shame. And instead of running to God, you run away from God. And you're carrying this bitterness. And you're hiding. And you're hiding. And you put on a bigger mask and a bigger mask. And you carry all this shame into the next relationship. And now instead of forgiving them, you're carrying the bitterness. And now because of the bitterness, now you feel shame. And it's just a cycle over and over. And the enemy hasn't changed his method since the beginning of time. And here's what I want to encourage you with. The Bible says this in Romans. It says, there is no condemnation if you're in Christ. And because you belong to him, the power of the life-giving spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. There's no condemnation because you've been freed from that. You know what that means? That means when I do something in my relationships or in any other area of my life, when I make a choice because of deception and, and shame comes on me, I don't run away from God, but I can run to God. Why? Because there's no condemnation. There's no condemnation. In other words, God isn't waiting to like zap you because of what you did. He's waiting to embrace you, to forgive you, to restore you, to heal the roots, to expose the deception. So that shame doesn't trap you. So you don't live in cycles of shame, cycles of defeat. Different relationship, same scenario. The names change and the faces change. The storyline pretty much remains the same. Why? Because deception is a cycle. And for some of you, you feel like relationally you're on a merry-go-round that you can't get off of. And it's different names, different faces, but the story seems to be about the same every time, over and over and over and over and over. And it could be because you're in a cycle of deception. And it starts, the enemy just a little bit, getting you to question what God says. And then he downplays the consequences. It's not gonna be that bad. Then he makes you think that God doesn't want anything good for you that his intentions towards you aren't good. and Then he gets you to think that you'd be better off just calling the shots yourself. Why do it God's way? I can do it my way. And then as soon as you do that, smacks you upside the face with shame. And the cycle begins again. So what do we do? Because up till now, that's pretty depressing news. There is a way, there is a way out of that. And I would propose that it's this. It begins with maybe I should say resubmitting to God's word. God, I'm not gonna adjust your word to fit my life. I'm gonna adjust my life to fit your word. I'm not gonna adjust. I'm not gonna bring your word to my standard, I'm gonna bring my life up to your standard. And where it confronts me, I'm gonna wrestle with it. And where it corrects me, I'm gonna receive it. But I'm gonna submit to your word. Number two, I'm gonna surround myself with godly people. This is why small groups are so important in this season. This is why Group Connect, and we talk about this, and it's not because you know we're just bored and don't have anything else to do. It's because you need community around you. You need godly people around you that encourage you, that, that, that have eyes to see the things that maybe you're missing. 
that'll encourage you, that'll speak life into you, that when shame is overwhelming you, that will go, no, you're completely loved by God, you're totally accepted by the Father, that you're cared for, that you have purpose, that you have destiny, that God has a plan for your life. Get your head up, get your shoulders back, get your spine stiffened. If God be for you, then who be against you? No weapon formed against you will prosper. You need godly community around you. It speaks life into you. Number three, you just need to seek wisdom. The Bible says, although it costs you everything, get wisdom. I would propose you don't find this on your Facebook feed. I would propose you don't find this on TikTok before it leaves us and goes back to China. You find this in prayer, in community, in church, godly people. Number four, stay seated in grace. When you blow it, don't let the enemy get you out of grace. Don't let him get you thinking you gotta jump through some hoops, do some things for God to like you again. He never stopped liking you. Never stopped loving you. Just stay seated in grace. And don't just stay seated in it, but be a giver of it. Be a giver of it. You know why? Because in these things called relationships, we're all on a journey. And some days we're winning, some days we're learning. But if you'll stay seated in grace, you're never losing. Some days you're winning, some days you're learning. If you'll stay seated in grace, you'll never be losing. So make sure the roots are good. Make sure the roots aren't feeding on deception. Because you get good roots, you'll get good fruit. Make sure you're staying submitted to God's word, staying in community, seeking wisdom, seated in the grace of God that he's not done with me yet. I'm getting better every day. I'm getting better every day. Do you receive the word of God today? Come on, let's, if you would bow your heads with me and close your eyes. Maybe some of you today, before we wrap up, you're here and you've never, you've never received the grace of God. When I talked about being seated in grace, that you're not having to work for God's approval, that, that's foreign language to you. The Bible says that, that the gift of salvation, the gift of forgiveness of sins, it's a gift of God so that no one gets the credit. And so if if you're feeling far from God today, the answer isn't try harder, do better, read more, pray more, all that is wonderful. But if you're far from God today, the answer is faith. Faith alone in Jesus alone. Not faith in your good works, not faith in you turning over a new leaf, faith in the reality that Jesus gave his life for your sins to be completely and totally forgiven. And if that's you today, you'd say, Pastor, I feel in my heart, whether you're in one of our locations, you're online, no matter what room you're in today, say, I feel in my heart today, I'm far from God, but I don't wanna be. The Bible says that if you'll confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. It's not my words, it's the words of scripture. And so today, if that's your desire, you'd say, that's me. I, I want to make that decision today. I, I want to come to God. I want to come back to God, maybe, for some of you. You've walked away. In just a moment, I'm, we're going to pray together as a church. And if you'd say, I want to be included in that prayer, whether you're online or one of our campuses. And in just a moment, I'm going to count to three. I just want you to shoot your hand up. With no one looking around, I wouldn't embarrass you for the world. You would just say, this is me. I'm, by raising my hand, I'm saying, I believe in my heart 
In just a moment when we pray, we'll confess with our mouth and according to God's word, you'll be saved. So if that's you, with no one looking around, you'd say, Pastor, that's me at every location. If you're in the chat, just put the hand emoji in the chat. You'd say, that's me, I'm, I'm far from God. I don't wanna be today, I wanna make that decision. On three, you just shoot your hand up. One, two, three, you just shoot it up high. God bless you, God bless you. You can put them down. Why don't you pray this out loud with me, church? Everyone, for the benefit of those that are praying for the first time, just say, Jesus, I need you. I ask you to forgive me of all my sin. I believe you died for me. I believe God raised you from the dead. Today, I make you my Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Come on, let's celebrate those who made that decision. Hey, hope today's message was helpful for your life. I wanna tell you, you should subscribe. The reason why, you can get content pushed to you all the time. You don't have to wonder if you ever missed anything. And also, I want you to think about giving. By giving, you can help us take this message to so many other people that are in need of some hope, need of some encouragement, and you can be a part of making a difference in the life of so many people. Look forward to seeing you right back here next time.